Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to start on the concept of ecology. And so we're going to look at like the larger view of ecology from the population's perspective, mostly. Each population, which is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area or habitat, has certain characteristics. The population size is the number of individuals making up its gene pool. The age structure defines the relative proportions of individuals of each age, especially with respect to reproductive years and potential, the reproductive base. Population density is the number of individuals per unit of area or volume in its habitat and population distribution, which refers to the general pattern in which the population members are dispersed throughout its habitat. Populations can be dispersed in three patterns. It's very common for members of a population to live in clumps for these reasons. Because suitable physical, chemical, and biological conditions are patchy, not uniform, because many animals form social groups, and also because many offspring are not highly mobile and are forced to live where they landed. Uniform dispersion is rare in nature. When it does occur, it usually is a result of fierce competition for limited resources. Random dispersion occurs in nature if equal environmental conditions are in the habitat and members are neither attracting nor repelling each other. Population size is dependent on births, immigration, deaths, and emigration. Remember, immigration means coming in, emigration means going out. Population size may also change on a predictable basis as a result of daily or seasonal events called migrations. Zero population growth designates a near balance of births and deaths. The biotic potential is the population at, is its maximum rate of increase under ideal or non-limiting conditions. The biotic potential varies from species to species because of three parameters. One, the age at which each generation starts producing. Two, how often reproduction occurs. And, and three, how many offspring are born each time. But there are many limiting factors on uh, growth of populations. There are density dependent and density independent. Density dependent limiting factors mean that the actual rate of increase of a population is influenced by its environmental conditions. Limiting factors such as nutrient supply, predation, competition for space, pollution, and metabolic waste provide environmental resistance to population growth. The main density dependent factors are competition for resources, predation, parasitism, and disease, which exert their effects in proportion to the number of individuals present, especially with disease and parasitism, the number of individual dense, uh, the population density. And you can see that um, with the picture on the left, that's a picture of a doctor during the Black Plague. They wore those weird little masks. Density independent limiting factors um, are basically kind of random events. Some events, such as weather, tend to increase the death rate without respect to the number of individual present, like a harsh winter, for example. Lightning, floods, snowstorms, and the like affect large populations as well as small groups. The sustainable supply of resources defines the carrying capacity for a particular population in a given, given environment. The carrying capacity can vary over time and is expressed graphically in the S-shaped curve pattern called logistic growth, which you see here. Logistic growth deals with density-dependent controls. Okay, so from populations, populations live in a community. So a habitat is a place where an organism lives, and it's characterized by distinctive physical features, vegetation, and the array of species living in it. A, communi a community is an association of interacting populations of different species living in a particular habitat. Five factors shape the structure of the community. One, interactions between climate and topography dictate rainfall, temperature, soil composition, and so on. Two, availability of food and resources affects its inhabitants. Three, Adaptive traits enable individuals to exploit specific resources. 
Four, interactions of various kinds occur among the inhabitants. These can include competition, predation, and mutualism. And five, the overall pattern of population size affects community structure. Several community properties are the result of the factors above. Varying numbers of species are found in feeding levels or trophic levels from producers to consumers. Diversity tends to increase in tropical climates, creating species richness, and it decreases as you move toward the poles. The niche or niche is of each species is defined by the sum of activities and relationships in which it engages to secure and use the resources necessary for its survival and reproduction. The fundamental niche is the one that could prevail in the absence of competition. The realized niche results from shifts in large and small ways over time as individuals of the species respond to a mosaic of changes. Interactions between species in a community can occur between any two species or between entire communities. They include intraspecific and interspecific interactions. Intraspecific means they happen all within uh, members of the same species, and interspecific means that they happen between members of different species. There are several types of symbiosis or symbiotic two species interactions. Commensalism is where one species benefits while the other is not affected. For example, a bird's nest sitting in a tree benefits the bird, doesn't benefit the tree, but it doesn't harm the tree. Mutualism is where there is a symbiotic relationship where both species benefit. Interspecific competition means that both species are harmed by the interaction, and predation and parasitism are considered the same thing by a biologist. Predators are just considered parasites of that species. They just hunt them down and kill them. So one species, the predator or the parasite, will benefit while the other, the prey or host, is harmed. There are many examples of mutualistic relationships in nature. Facultative mutualism involves helpful but non-essential interactions like ants and aphids. Obligatory mutualism is where each species has to have access to the other in order for it, it to complete its life cycle and reproduce. One example is the yucca moth, which you see here. It feeds only on the yucca plant, which is a completely dependent upon the moth for pollination. Another is the symbiotic relationship between lichy, lichens and algae in lichens. Um, they, you know, one feeds the other and the other one protects the other. There are two major uh, categories of competition. Competition within a population of the same species is intraspecific and that's usually fierce and may result in depletion of a resource. So think about it like this. Let's say you live in a town of 600 people and all of a sudden there's no way to get food in or out of that town. So the first thing that people do is they go and raid the grocery stores. So there's a lot of competition amongst the people, so it's intraspecific, and it leads to depletion of the resources which are found at the grocery store. Interspecific competition is less intense because the requirements are less similar than between, uh, between the competitors than there are between intraspecific. Predators get their food from prey, but they don't take up residence on or in their prey like parasites do. Many of the adaptations of predators and their prey arose through coevolution, where the species evolved jointly as their close ecological interactions exerted selection pressures on each other over many generations. Predators are the selective agents that favor improved prey defenses in their prey. Prey with the better defenses are selective agents that form, favor more effective predators. So it works both ways. The coevolutionary arms race continues today amongst many interspecies reaction or competitions. Prey defenses can take a lot of different. Um, they can take a lot of different uh, forms, and uh, one of them uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. But I'm going to look at the Canada lynx and the snowshoe hare. 
These two are very dependent upon one another. For example, the Canada lynx almost eats entirely nothing but snowshoe hare. And the snowshoe hare have to be very, very quick, and they also produce lots of offspring and turn colors in the winter versus the summer. They're, in the summer, they're brown, in the winter, they're white to blend in. So the ones that do the best job of escaping and blending are the ones that produce offspring. Similarly, the Canada lynx that is best able to identify that snowshoe hare is the one that gets to gain more food and therefore produce more offspring. So that's how they work together. Back to prey defenses. Camouflage is an adaptation in form, color, pattern, or behavior that allows a prey or predator to blend in with its surroundings. In mimicry, prey not equipped with defenses may escape predators by resembling more toxic prey. And you can see that here with the viceroy uh, and monarch butterfly. The viceroy is not poisonous, but the monarch is. Warning coloration in toxic prey offers bright colors or bold patterns that serve as warning to predators saying that they're toxic. That's also what the monarch does, and that's what this poison dart frog does. And finally, there's moment of truth defenses. They allow prey animals to defend themselves by startling or intimidating the predator with a display behavior or secretions of irritating chemical repellents or toxins. So you think of like bombardier beetles, they spray out an acid that's really, really hot. That startles the predator into dropping them. But predators also have responses that are adaptive. Stealth and camouflage are used by predators along with ingenious ways of avoiding the toxins or repellents with countermeasures. And some predators can just plain outrun their prey and track them down. Parasites drain nutrients from their hosts, weakening them and making them more vulnerable to predators and less attractive to potential mates. Parasite infections cause sterility and shift the ratio of males to females in their host resulting in lower birth rates, higher death rates, and having an effect on competitive interactions among the hosts. Killing a host is not usually good evolutionary strategy for the parasite. Usually death results only when a parasite attacks a new host or when the number of parasites overwhelms the host's defenses. There are several kinds of parasites. All viruses, some bacteria, protists, and fungi are parasites. Many tapeworms, flukes, roundworms, insects, and of course those nasty ticks are also parasites. Even a few plants can be parasitic. Finally, parasitoids. These are kind of a little bit different. These are specific types of insects that develop inside other insects, which they devour and kill as they develop. And so you can see a monarch butterfly caterpillar being infested by these wasp eggs. And so they're going to burrow into its body while it's still alive, basically use it as a mobile refrigerator until they overwhelm him, he dies, and they emerge. Okay, so that concludes the introduction to ecology. It's kind of a morbid ending note, but you know, oh well. And then we'll go on into the ecosystems and human impacts on the next lecture. Have a good day.